thank you so much for watching. Now, last night we had a passionate conversation, or the beginnings of, but we didn't have enough time. We've got plenty of time now to continue that conversation, which was about whether the uh, LNP did the wrong thing by replacing Andrew Lamming in a seat in Queensland with another bloke. There were lots of other women who were in the pre-selection process, but the bloke got up, the ladies did not. Lisa Goddard is the lady who we were having that conversation with, but alas, the lady she was having that argument with, Liz Storer, well, she was on another show tonight. So Evan Mulholland will be playing the part of, uh, of Liz Storer, but you don't have to take up that fight. Of course, from the IPA, uh, Lisa is, of course, with us in uh, uh, Brisbane right now, as whatever the heck was just driving past your place, Evan, just drove past. So, uh, again, let's go back where we were. Um, so why do you think the Liberal Party made the wrong choice in this bloke? Is there something wrong with this bloke or is it the decision-making process that meant in a lineup of six people they chose the one guy? So back to the robust conversation, Paul. So where we left it off was what I was saying was with, with, with Julia Banks's book, and I, and I agree with what you've been saying all night, but what I wanted to focus on was the fact about what she said in terms of pre-selection. So here in Queensland, we had, as you say, five people put their hand up, four were women, one was a man. Now, that one man was outed from someone within the LNP, and no doubt that's part of some sort of dirty tricks campaign, but that's a whole other story. But the message that he wrote in a group chat about 10 or 12 years ago, and I'll quote it again just for anyone who wasn't watching last night, is it says, it states, he states quite clearly that in the Bible that basically having sex with a fat chick is a sin beyond redemption. Mm. Now, his response to that when that was leaked or that was put out into the public arena wasn't to say the words which you would expect, which is, I'm sorry or I was wrong, but his quote was, it doesn't reflect the person I've grown to be like lots of men, I'm embarrassed about some of the things I've said when I was younger, I would never say today. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think that is good enough. We've got the Prime Minister of this country who very deliberately said he would like to see a female in that, in that, chosen for that pre-selection. We know the problems that the Prime Minister is having as far as women's issues. And look, I am not one at all for quotas. I think, and I have fought my way through my career, on my merit. You know, you get there on hard work, you get there on being smart, you get there on being tenacious, you don't get there through playing dirty tricks. And I think this is a letdown. I think the, this, of the four other women, one of them was a barrister, so she has the credentials. She is the type of smart, independent woman that we would want to see put forward. So clearly, questions need to start to be asked about what is happening with these branch members it's all about the numbers. We know that. It's all about, you know, how many people you can get in there to, to back you up, get your numbers on your side. I think there needs to be greater transparency. There needs to be some level. The Prime Minister can't make a captain's call on this. I'm not, I'm not going to that extreme. But surely someone within the parliamentary wing needs to be able to have a say. They win the election. These are the people that they have to work with, that they have to govern with. Well, Surely it can't just come down to branch members. Well, and also, as you say too, which is, is that let's imagine that it all comes down to a one-seat majority at the end of the game, right? It means for the next three years they're trying to mm -hmm. pick off that one person and he, of course, goes in with a target on his yep. back because of the language in and around all of that. Um, what about the role of the members and here? Let's get to, the, let's get to the, that philosophical point, though, Evan, which is the role of membership in deciding who their local MPs are versus central office being able to say, sorry, we don't care whether you've got the majority of people in the room, there is a fundamental flaw with the person you are about to pick. Well, having been a Liberal Party member for well over a decade, I can tell you grassroots Liberal Party members very jealously guard their right to have a say in their local pre-selection. And when pre-selections roll around, and they don't roll around very often in, in safer seats uh, like that one, uh, they want to have a say over who they think is best for their community and who they think is best for their party. I think there's a broader point that... Um, if uh, every basically every candidate under 35 has a social media uh, pro, uh, profile and, and history and shouldn't be judged, I don't think, on things that they've said uh, 10, uh, 12 years ago. I think we're a Judeo-Christian country. We should believe in the idea of redemption. Uh, this particular candidate has, seems to have done the hard yards 
uh, in the community. He was a, a state candidate in the area, uh, put himself forward for, for that election and lost, but um, seems to have done the work in, in winning over branch members. And I don't, I don't disagree that the other the other candidates were well qualified, and I hope they, they do run again. But we, if you're a membership organisation, those members, those party members, should have a say in who's going to represent them in Canberra, yeah. rather than the other way around. Canberra shouldn't decide who's going to represent a local community. Lisa? I'm not saying I'm not saying Canberra should decide, but I'm saying at the end of the day, it is the, it is the politicians in Canberra who have to work with this person. So there has to be surely some sort of transparency, some sort of accountability that's put into place, another level of protection, if you like, because we do know that you know if, if I decided today to put my hand up and I have no interest in doing it, but put my hand up to, to try to get pre-selection, it is about bringing in as many people as I can. To, to stack those numbers so that I can have the votes on my side. It, it is that simple. So, yes, I agree with you, Evan. People do make mistakes. And really, if you're going to put something on social media, you need to know that at some point, if you step into public life, that could very well be up on a billboard in front of your house. And if you're not prepared for it to be there front and centre, don't write it. You know, how many times have we all tried to write a tweet and gone, mm, and pulled it back? Because <laughs> we know you don't do it. Yeah, and there's a, there's look, a reason I'm off the Twitters, to, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And look, I think, sadly, we are going to get to a position in this society where if you want to be a politician, say, 20 years down the track, you need to make that decision at about the age of 16, 17. Don't put things on social media. You are going to live the most beige life and you are going to be so controlled because you are at so at risk of anything that you say being used against you. And then, we're, and I, then people like oh, me are going to sit here and talk about how beige our politicians are, but we make them beige uh, in, in they, some they, ways. They for, will be. They yeah. will be. I'm with you. All right. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, it, Evan, I'm sure, like me, uh, you don't mind a bit of Joe Rogan in your life. Uh, now, what he's been able to do uh, is have a great podcast built up over a really long period of time. Now he couldn't be more powerful. Paid $100 million for the rights to his podcast to turn up on Spotify. But if you've never heard of this guy, he's a guy who is a stand-up comedian, uh, does some commentary work for the UFC, but he's a bloke who does the most dangerous thing in the world. Think out loud. Now, you may disagree with everything that he thinks, but you can <laughs> see him thinking out loud, working out an issue, not saying, not putting all those little caveats that you put around things where you say, well, hang on, now, just just from the other, just for a second here, devil's advocate, all of that, he just goes, well, hang on, but what if, what, you know, I love that about um, uh, Joe Rogan, I love that about most performers, and I wish that we had more of it in our media here, but the New York Times does not like the idea that this bloke has built up a following all on his own. He's done it without mainstream media. He's done it with supporters all the way around the world, and they hate him. In fact, the Joe Rogan experience is effectively a series of wandering conversations, often over whiskey and weed on topics, uh, but not limited to comedy, cage fighting, psychedelics, quantum mechanics, and the political excesses of the left. <gasps> Evan, how dare that we like Joe Rogan? Exactly. I actually found Joe Rogan uh, through the UFC as a big UFC fan, but I, I think this proves that... Uh, Cancel culture really only can feast off the flesh of uh, corporations that don't have a backbone. Yep. If you do have a backbone, then uh, people like Joe Rogan are going to succeed and other people will succeed as well. Uh, so I, I think if corporations are a lot stronger, uh, start listening to their audience rather than their woke PR department spivs, uh, then I think we'll see a lot more Joe Rogans. But more to the point, Joe Rogan is having conversations that everyday people are having in a way that everyday people have them. We see, uh, you know, the, the New York Times and, uh, and the ABC here and other uh, institutions pushing on us this identity politics, this critical race theory, this boring wokeness uh, it, within this narrow framework of, of political correctness. And he's out there talking like the average uh, American is, like the average mainstream person is, and people like it. And I think we all agree that this program would be way better if the host was allowed to smoke a cigar during the program. Guests could drink whatever they and want. Guests. Which is, It's a kickback. You can smoke, you can drink, whatever. You know, Lisa, kickback. I don't know what the favourite thing to drink or do this time of night is, but you can do it uh, next time when we get some freedom. I didn't tell you what's in the cup. <laughs> Very good call. But, Lisa, are you a Joe Rogan fan into it at all? 
I'm going to be completely honest, and I wasn't until I started doing some research tonight and I started to watch some of the videos. You're going to love I have him. to say that the backdrop looks very, very familiar to the man cave, I have to say, Paul Murray. <laughs> a little uh, inspiration so, here you know, or there, If you swap yes. out the jacket and put on a bit of a T-shirt, you, you, may, you may just get there. <laughs> I'll do is, some shaving exactly, too. <laughs> it's exactly what Evan said. You know, it, it's telling the truth. It, if you sit around a barbecue and you talk to you know, normal people... These are the conversations that they're having. And what I love from what I saw tonight is that he gets responses from the White House. He gets responses from Fauci because he puts them under pressure. He actually talks about the things that they're uncomfortable with having out in the public arena. It's what mainstream media you know, will call fake news or not want to discuss. He was one of the first, as you probably already know, to talk about the fact that you know the Chinese Wuhan, flu, Wuhan virus. So... Yeah. You know, he's not frightened to say what most other people, like you say, put the caveat on and go, OK, I don't want to offend anyone on Twitter yeah, and, yeah, you, know, yeah. uh, you know, I have to fact check this and, you know, enough is enough. Like, let's just say what it is and call it as it is. And that's why he has the followers that he does. I'm with you. Good on you, mate. Thank you, guys. Enjoy a deep dive into Joe Rogan. Uh, obviously, after this program is done and after <laughs> Gleeso and after... Anyway, yeah. at some point in the next week, enjoy the deep dive. Thank you, guys. Now, can